Hey everybody, my name is Adam Neely. This is question and answer time. I'm here answering all of your questions about bass and music in general. So let's get started. Uh, before we begin, I want to give a shout out to Geronimo Capelli because for one of his music classes, he analyzed my band Sungazer's tune, Drunk. I am very flattered by that. If anybody else wants to analyze my band's music, uh, that would be awesome. Send it to me. So anyway, let's get started. Language Pepe writes, The science in this is cool, bro, but if you listen to pop music now, it is actually bad. Go listen to that Beyonce song about putting a ring on it. When that was on the radio all the time, it drove me crazy. That song equals simple beat that I don't ever recall changing, some strings that aren't very melodic, Mario jumping. If you like it, then you should put on a ring on it times a thousand. Okay, so this really isn't a question, but... I'm just gonna use this as an excuse to talk about single ladies because for whatever reason, when people talk about how bad pop music is, they single out single ladies. And I find that kind of strange because the song itself is rather strange. If you need a refresher on what Beyonce single lady sounds like, this is the chorus melody. It's a fairly simple E major melody descending stepwise from B to F sharp, but what makes it really strange is its context in the chorus. This is what it sounds like. Of course, this is a MIDI recreation because we don't want to anger the monetization gods. Whew, there is a lot of stuff going on there. And not all of it says E major. A lot of it contradicts the E majorness of the melody. That signature flute arpeggio sample that plays throughout the entire track has a pretty prominent D natural in it. The presence of this D natural in this flute sample thing kind of reminds me of the technique of overblowing woodwind instruments, which is when you cycle through upper harmonics of a fundamental by, I guess, like blowing really hard against the flute. I'm not a flautist, but I've seen them do it. If you analyze the arpeggio this way, it's like you're overblowing an E natural fundamental at the sixth harmonic, the seventh harmonic, the eighth harmonic, the ninth harmonic, and then the tenth harmonic, skipping the eleventh harmonic and going to the twelfth harmonic. The effect of this is that the flute sample is kind of halfway in between this timbral texture that floats on top of all the rest of the harmony, and also very much a part of the rest of the harmony. That D natural in the harmonic series ends up being the minor seventh or lowered seventh in the key of E major. Technically speaking, the seventh harmonic is also a little bit flat from our 12 tone equal tempered system, but we'll ignore that for right now. The notes which are really strange though and kind of conflict with the E major melody are in the bass. We start the bass line out basically by hitting a big old C natural. That C natural creates a pretty spicy augmented fifth interval with the G sharp in the melody. If you were going to assign a chord symbol, it would be probably C major seven sharp five, which is a very strange chord to begin the chorus of a number one pop song. Now you could say that this chorus is an example of polymodality. The melody is in E major, but then the bass line is kind of like in E minor. C natural would come from the E natural minor scale. But that would kind of be ignoring the flute arpeggio's role in this harmonic tapestry because the flute arpeggio has a D natural and a G sharp, so it would almost be like it's from E mixolydian. My interpretation of the chorus to single ladies is that it's actually in mixolydian flat six, the fifth mode of the melodic minor. E mixolydian flat six would have the notes E, F sharp, G sharp, A, B, C natural, and D natural, all of which are present in various strata of the chorus of single ladies. Mixolydian flat six is honestly one of my favorite modes because it starts out sounding very bright at the beginning of the scale, but then starts sounding darker and darker as you go up. It also happens to invert to itself. If you take the intervallic content of the scale and build it downwards instead of upwards, you get mixolydian flat six as well. It's one of only two seven note scales that don't have consecutive half steps that can do this. The other scale, by the way, in case you're interested in taking notes at home, is Dorian. Anyway, I think it's really cool that the chorus of single ladies is in Mixolydian flat six. It's the only example of that I can think of in pop music. And it's not the only weird thing about single ladies. For example, did you know that it starts with a measure of three, four? It also has a random measure of 3-4 out of the bridge. And speaking of the end of the bridge, the bridge ends with five measures of B7. B7 
B7 is the 5 7 in the key of E, it's the dominant chord. And we might call this, in classical music theory, dominant prolongation. Dominant prolongation is a technique that's occasionally used at the end of the development section of the sonata allegro form. Basically, the five chord just keeps repeating over and over again as melodic material develops that propels us from the end of the development section into the beginning of the recapitulation. This is what happens in single ladies. We build tension at the end of the bridge by developing melodic material over a long five chord which propels us forward into the next section. As far as I know, there's really not a whole lot in the way of dominant prolongation in pop music from the past 20 or 30 years. Although, please, if anybody has any examples, let me know. Anyway, I think these compositional quirks of single ladies are super cool because they really distinguish the song from other pop songs and they're interesting. But when most people think about the song or analyze the song, they're analyzing, of course, the music video or maybe analyzing things like the lyrics. But the most subtle things can sometimes elude us. So if you ever have a knee-jerk reaction to a pop song that you hate, try and figure out exactly why you hate it. Try and analyze it a little bit because you might be kind of surprised to see what actually went into it. Rogue Cherokee writes, Hey Adam, love your videos. I'm curious, do you think that playing video games like Guitar Hero could improve your technical skills on a real instrument? Like finger speed, movement around the neck, etc. I think it would be kind of similar to the method of practicing on your forearm. Thanks. All right, so the value of practicing on your forearm does not come from developing finger dexterity or whatever. It comes from creating a mental map of your instrument. You're really not doing that in any meaningful way if you're playing Guitar Hero. The mental mapping is different. The task is different. My very first bass student was a Guitar Hero master, and he thought that he could take the skills of Guitar Hero and apply it on a real instrument. He was very sadly mistaken. He lasted for only two lessons and then quit. Although, to be honest, I was also new at teaching, so maybe I just sucked at teaching. Who knows? I guess an analogy here would be like, if you thought that swinging a baseball bat would improve your golf swing. I mean, yeah, technically the movements might be similar, but they are radically different in terms of conception. So I strongly doubt that being good at Guitar Hero will make you a better guitarist or bass player. I, I just don't see it. Carl Enquist writes, if it sounds good, it's good. It's freaking art. That's very true, however. Music is both a craft and an art form, and if you showed up to a lesson with somebody saying, like, if it sounds good, it's good, you'd probably want your money back. If you go to a guitar teacher, you'd expect them to show you scales and patterns and chords and how to apply them. You'd expect them to teach you practice regimens and things that they personally did to get better at their craft. Art is obviously the end goal, but it's facilitated by the craft. It's facilitated by those technical details that you can only get from somebody saying, you're doing it wrong, here's how to do it better. If nobody worked on their craft, we wouldn't get art. So yes, if it sounds good, it is good. But the question is, how do you get it to sound good? Denny Crane writes, I can see where Damien came from. Jazz ensemble and high is a different story. There is a hierarchy. There are often multiple drummers that will trade off on songs versus being an alternate understudy. And there are lots of competitions and festivals. Him telling a caricature of his high school experience from the point of view of a collegiate ensemble certainly didn't translate well. Okay, so part of the reason why I was annoyed about Whiplash is because writer-director Damien Chazelle set his story in my world, the world of New York City jazz, specifically in higher education. It's a small world with a very specific culture and is the only representation of that world in popular media, and he got it very, 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 very wrong. However, I got this interesting email from somebody who was in the Princeton High School studio band, the same band that Damien Chazelle was part of and based Whiplash on. They mentioned that being in the studio band felt very much like being on a sports team, and that the music culture was obsessed with competition, and influenced how the players related to music. This, of course, was a big problem I had with Whiplash. The relationship between person and art just felt so wrong to me. The email goes on to mention that the original short film Whiplash was set in a high school, but upon adapting it for the big screen, they insisted that no one would believe that this was happening at a high school. All of this clarifies a lot of stuff for me, to be honest, but it's still super frustrating to see music rather poorly characterized in the big screen. It's a great movie, though. Ryan Martin writes, A question for your next Q&A. 
What are your thoughts on YouTube videos as valid academic sources? You obviously use references in your videos, and like other YouTubers who have grown in popularity in the last year or two, your videos are clearly well-researched. Obviously, there's no peer review process, but as far as I'm aware, the authors of books only answer to their publishers and editors anyway, right? Should YouTube videos be considered gray literature? I mean, as much as I value the work that I've done, the big thing here is that there really isn't any editorial review. I mean, I put a lot of work trying to make things right, but it's really just up to me. I research my videos, I write my scripts, I edit them, and I upload them with no middleman. I mean, even something like Wikipedia has editorial review, right? You have a bunch of people working to get the truest version of the article. There was an interesting thread on Twitter where the Society for Music Theory was accepting nominations for their publication awards, and it got brought up that, you know, video essays might be a kind of publication that should be considered. And I'm hesitant on that. I don't really think that my videos fit exactly within the academic framework. They're close, but it's something different. Mars Crasher writes, What about Thundercat's bass solo and Flying Lotus's Never Catch Me? Okay, so I made this video about why I felt that in most circumstances, bass solos were not compositionally ideal for the song. And of course, tons of people leave comments like, Well, what about this bass solo? This example of a bass solo, however, is, is not that. Thundercat's bass solo on Never Catch Me is just awesome. It explodes out of Kendrick Lamar's verse in a way that just like, ugh. It's so good, it feels so right. I love this song so much. So definitely check out Never Catch Me if you want an example of a really awesome bass solo. Ali Zali writes, you have a really weird way of pronouncing leg. Yeah, so I have a Maryland accent. You heard that correctly. Maryland accent. It's not really how it's portrayed in 30 Rock. Oh, that was before I got rid of my Maryland accent. That accent's idiotic. And also, I don't really say things like Balmer or Washington, D.C., but I will say the word leg as leg or the egg. Uh, I also say the word them as them. And <laughs> I don't know, for the longest time, I didn't really think that I had an accent, and then somebody pointed those things out and was like, oh, yeah, I definitely do that. That's, that's a little silly. <laughs> Bo Diddley writes, Are you sure it was originally Scotch Snaps? Or is it called Scotch Snaps because there's far less research done on African heritage and someone only had research on Scottish music at the time and they called it that? One thing that happens in America is that we base our history on European culture, completely ignoring the thousands of years of various African cultures that pre-existed those European cultures. So I really wanted to emphasize in my last video that the rhythm was coming from the language. And the way that we speak in contemporary American English, including African American vernacular English, we speak using those scotch snaps. This, of course, brings up the interesting point. What would the correlation be between African languages like Yoruba or Swahili or Zulu or any of them and African music? And of course, there isn't that research yet. There were some great and super informative comments that left some academic research onto African language prosody, which might be useful in understanding some of this stuff, but I think this is a field of research that is super exciting and nobody has done yet. So the relationship between African languages and African music, that would be the next step, and I I'm really want somebody to pick that up, somebody more qualified than me to pick that up, but once you publish that paper, let me know, because I will, I would love to make a video about it. <laughs> Robert Roberts writes, is there a reason that Berkeley hasn't offered you a teaching position yet? I don't know. I wouldn't mind teaching at Berkeley. So if you're in charge of hiring at Berkeley, uh, you know, give me a call, because I do know that your teachers use my videos in the classroom already, and quite frequently, too. <laughs> uh, you're welcome, by the way.